WVIZ TV, Cleveland. In our next program, we're going to look at what has been called the first freedom, freedom of the press. Is a free press an indispensable instrument of rational government, or is it a serious threat to such government? Hi, this is Ed Driscoll. Welcome to Silicon Graffiti. Back in 1989, when the Rolling Stones were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Mick Jagger jokingly had this to say. Um, Jean, Cocteau, Jean Cocteau said, I'm going, said that Americans are funny people. First you shock them, then they put you in a museum. <laughs> Journalism has long had a shock element to it, used to sell newspapers and build ratings. It certainly was a common motif during the days of William Randolph Hearst's yellow journalism, an era which 1941 Citizen Kane parodies with this classic scene. Read the cable. Girls delightful in Cuba, stop. Could send you prose poems about scenery, but don't feel right spending your money. Stop. There is no war in Cuba. Signed, Wheeler. Any answer? Yes, dear Wheeler, you provide the prose poems. I'll provide the war. That's <laughs> fine, Mr. Kane. Yes, I rather like myself. So, right away. I Back in the 1970s, the New York Daily News certainly meant to shock with this infamous headline. And more recently, the media as a whole have attempted to shock the nation with wildly invented stories of the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, and Newsweek with its entirely fabricated and then quickly denied stories of Korans being tossed down the toilets at Guantanamo Bay. These stories represent a sort of Grand Guggenal era in modern journalism, byproducts of an industry with declining advertising and declining audiences. Thomas Sowell quipped in 2004. During his long tenure as NBC News anchorman, Tom Brokaw took that program from last place among the big three broadcast networks to first place. But he had more viewers when he was in last place more than 20 years ago than he had in first place this year. That is because fewer people now watch NBC, ABC, or CBS News. Good. Only a few weeks ago, the political calculations weblog spotted this trend line. Sometime within the next 12 to 18 months, the average circulation of the weekday edition of the New York Times will drop below 1 million. This event marks the continuing decline in the fortunes of what had been the U.S. newspaper of record, as the New York Times average circulation has been well above this level for decades. So it's probably not all that surprising that near the end of a decade in which the best bloggers have outpaced traditional journalists in terms of offering a diversity of opinion never before seen, that old media should have a museum of its own. It's no rock and roll hall of fame, but it does offer a certain camp appeal of its own. Of course, there may be some things that the First Amendment doesn't cover. Here's Bart Simpson at the blackboard writing, the First Amendment does not cover burping. And like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, it's a reminder that there are performers, there's an audience, and in the past, never the twain shall meet. Along the perimeter are cases that explore themes and issues that confront journalists, and they contain hundreds of artifacts from the reporters who were there. These artifacts include everything from the red dress that Helen Thomas wore to White House press conferences, to the satchel that Nellie Bly carried in 1889 on her famous trek around the world in 80 days. This is a pretty stark reminder of what it's like when there is no freedom. It's a guard tower from the East German side of the old Berlin Wall. During the Cold War, there was no more visible symbol of the divide between East and West. It's blank on the East side. You couldn't express yourself, you could be shot. But on the West side, there were expressions of outrage and anger and cries for freedom. Curious, isn't it, that the man who shouted, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, was absolutely loathed by the vast majority of the press while he was in office. When CBS's Bill Plant toured the museum, he concluded his report by having his image digitally inserted into a photograph of the White House. It's a technology that Plant seems rather impressed by, despite the fact that a home PC will allow anyone to insert his image into a video, even from your garage. 
Now, you'll notice that even though what I see behind me is a gray wall, you see the White House, it's because it's electronically inserted. Not something that we're really allowed to do on a regular basis. In fact, they frown on it. But let's just pretend that I'm really at the White House and I could say, good morning. Today at the White House, they're going to try to tell us the best possible spin on what's going on and we're going to try to figure out what's really happening. Bill Plant, CBS News, at the museum, but at the White House, sort of. And barring that, given that you're CBS, you're almost as likely to simply make stuff up about what's happening in the White House, which is what has caused CBS's news ratings to plummet in the first place. To its credit, the museum has video highlighting one of the worst miscarriages of modern journalism. It occurred in the era just before the rise of the blogosphere, which at least allows individuals a chance to fight back against what was once an awesome and dangerous power. It's an interview with Richard Jewell, who underwent a trial by media after the Centennial Olympic Park bombing in Atlanta, Georgia in April of 1996. Well, this story started over here as me finding the bomb and being a hero, and by the time it got all the way around, I was the suspect and was the bomber of the Centennial Park. And they didn't care how it got from here to here. You have no concept. You have no idea. You know, just imagine when it's one camera or two or three reporters on one story, an investigative reporter on a story. Imagine how much heat that causes a certain story or a certain organization or a certain family. I had thousands, thousands of cameras, tens of thousands of reporters on me and what I did, Microsco microscoping and checking everything from my elementary school career up to the day of the bombing. And all because a couple of people would tell a story or tell half-truths, and a reporter not get confirmation. After botched news stories such as Jules, followed by, in the post-9-11 era, an accelerating amount of outright fabrications on an enormous scale, including but certainly not limited to Eason Jordan's admission that he let Saddam Hussein vet CNN's coverage of Iraq in the 1990s, CBS's Rathergate, Newsweek's Koran in the Can story, Reuters' Picture Kill, and fabulous such as the New York Times' Jason Blair and the New Republic's Scott Thomas Beauchamp, the bill has certainly come due on old media. What will be the likely outcome of this? Well, this classic multimedia presentation from 2004 offers one preview of online life in the future. Today, in 2014, the New York Times has gone offline. In feeble protest to Google's on hegemony, the Times has become a print-only newsletter for the elite and the elderly. But perhaps there was another way. Is that an accurate forecast of what life in the media world will resemble in six years? Well, it's probably as accurate as 2001 A Space Odyssey resembled the real 2001, but it does give a hint of the battle that's quietly raging between today's information sources, such as Google and the blogosphere, versus the surviving dinosaurs of the past era. What old media doesn't seem to understand is that the profession of journalism is one thing, the act of journalism is another. Anyone can report and opine on the news these days. All it takes is a blog or a YouTube page. That's a far cry, and on the whole, a much better system than the mid-20th century days of three television networks and a handful of newspapers per big city. And for those who don't believe how limited the flow of information was back then, at least they'll have a museum to visit to see how it was originally done in the not-so-good old days. For Silicon Graffiti, I'm Ed Driscoll.